the best thing to do is get started and get started early. So the earlier you can get started, the more you can start building this network, the more you can start building trust. Hello and welcome to another episode of Test, Optimize, and Scale. Have an exciting episode for you today. Have Adam Dornbush here with us today, founder, CEO of N-Tribe, going to be talking about UGC. N-Tribe is an innovative SaaS platform for this whole world, for this whole space, and how you can approach creation with a variety of different tactics. Adam, pleasure to have you here today. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. And uh, you're up in Lake Tahoe, correct? I am. I'm in the Truckee area. There you go. There you go. Sorry I like to point fall. that out as a big uh, snow snowboarding skiing fan. I share my time between Tahoe and the Bay Area. There you go. There you go. Two great places. And thought we'd start with your background, your history, your storyline into the creation of N Tribe. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll try to keep this quick, but I spent about 20 years in digital media, mostly buying and selling TV shows, doing business development for TV networks, film studios, everyone from Stars and Encore back in Denver, Tribeca Film back in New York, launched one of the first video on demand television networks out of Los Angeles. But I ended up at Current TV or Al Gore's television network where I ran BizDev up until the sale to Al Jazeera for half a billion dollars. And we were focused on citizen journalism, which at its core is user-generated content. We were licensing user-generated content from all over the world, trying to tell people's authentic stories. Um, fast forward, after I left Current, um, Nick over at GoPro tapped me and said, hey, we want to build a media company over here with all of the user-generated content coming from our cameras, all the photos and videos that are really telling the GoPro story. But we need to license that content at scale, package it together, distribute it through different media channels, everything from Xbox, PlayStation, um, YouTube, et cetera. And we, we've never done this before. So how do we license user-generated content at scale? So I came into GoPro, built the media company over there. We started licensing over 250,000 pieces of content a year, distributing it across everything from Virgin America seatbacks to you name it. And we really built the hype around GoPro. This is about 10, 11 years ago, up until about seven years ago when I left to build N-Tribe. And so the vision of N-Tribe was really take what we did at GoPro, but make it scalable for any company. So I left N-Tribe, I'm sorry, I left GoPro and I built this software package called N-Tribe, which basically makes it easy for any company to activate their authentic customers, license user-generated content at scale, and distribute it across whatever media channels they choose. Very nice. Very nice. I uh, am a GoPro fan, as I mentioned, the action sports background. So picturing a lot of what you're doing in those days and how you were able to take it to arenas with more scale. Uh, in terms of engagement, I, I think that is a common question we get here at the agency and with the founders listening in, with the marketers, even with the VC, VC industry professionals who are tuned in today. What are the best tactics towards engagement? What are ways you consistently can hit those high levels of performance with your content? Yep, and so great question. So there's two different levels of engagement that I talk about. I talk about how many views, how much attention is something getting, which is great. You know, it's reach and frequency, which is what most marketers are looking for. But more so today, people are looking for the engagement around that content. So. On social media, we're talking about likes and comments. On other platforms, there's different forms of engagement, but how much that content is resonating really is the true sign of a good marketer. And so the best thing is authenticity. Today, we're seeing authenticity resonate more than anything else because people can sniff through all the paid ads that you're getting fed every single day, all the influencer content, which may or may not be authentic. Um, and they're really reaching for what is true, what is real, and they're able to sniff through that through a lot of the new tools that are out there, as well as just the overexposure and oversaturation of content. So what we like to say is if people see authentic content that resonates, it's, you know, viral is the wrong word. It's going to resonate with that audience and it's going to permeate through their network. And so the more that you can do that, more that you can get a network effect from authentic content, the better for your marketing. Absolutely. There, and there is so much, I'll call it fluff out there today, whether, you know, it's a very clear paid activation, even if it's clearly states it, 
uh, you know, on one of these platforms and you question the motives, uh, or whether that's present or not, and it absolutely should be, being able to, to feel that, hey, th- th- this is a very real interaction between the brand and the content creator. They, they authentically care about what's going out here. They care about their audience, me, who's following, listening. So being able to have authenticity at the forefront is such a great approach. And more and more, even the opposite is true, where if they smell that it's not authentic, the audience is running away and they don't trust the brand anymore. So anything that sniffs of being a paid ad or inauthentic content or possibly not embraced by whoever's hawking that product, we're actually seeing, we actually ran a survey recently where over 81% of respondents said if they saw something from an influencer, it either had no effect on them or a negative effect on them, which really drives which drives home the point that you have to scream authenticity to resonate with any audience these days. Mm-hmm. And what are the best ways to make sure that authenticity is present? Is it having a, a personal story? Is it in the details? Is it being able to show an actual interaction with the product? What are some ways that you've seen audiences respond best and make sure that that authenticity is is there and, and loud? Yeah, you know, it's really unique to every brand. So we work with everyone from universities through Fortune 500 companies to one of the biggest tech giants in the world, all the way to the, some of the smallest brands. And so what we like to say is find your authentic community. And you might have multiple communities. It might be your employees. It might be your customers. It might be your students. It might be your alumni. Whoever your authentic community is, find them, talk to them, and see what they're saying. See what they're trying to talk about. And, you know, a lot of that happens on social media. Great place to discover creators, not a great place to discover quality content. And so what we like to say is, Go find your community, go find the creators that are already talking about your community and talking is typically through photos and videos these days. That's what resonates. And then work with them to create on-brand content because even if they're authentic, doesn't mean that content represents your brand in the way you want it to. But if you start working with them, if you start that one-on-one communication and our tool really helps people do that in a much easier scalable way, If you can create that communication, then you can give them tips and tricks. You can give them advice. And that's what we did really well at GoPro was we found lots of content. That 250,000 pieces of content a year, 1% of it was usable, if that. But by working with the creators, finding the best creators, working with them over time, the first time they create content for you, it's going to be terrible. The fifth time they create content for you, it's going to be awesome. And so the more that you can work with them over time, and it's little tips and tricks, it doesn't take a lot of effort. But by creating that relationship, you can create authentic on-brand content. 250,000, 1%, still 25,000 view uh, videos. I, I imagine even that was tough to sift through, prioritize, organize, use. Uh, once you were finding the right creators, or even just when you see ambassadors within the community, you know, you're, you're looking at communities, you're building your own. I know this is what Entribe does, what are the best ways to use in tribe? What are the best ways for founders to get in contact with an ambassador? Uh, let's say with an enthusiast, turn them into an ambassador, t- turn them into a content creator, continue to manage that UGC user generated content relationship. What are the best approaches for a sustainable relationship there? Yeah, you know, GoPro wasn't a unique position because obviously it was a camera company and it's an action sports company. So it was easy for us to get a volume of content. But pretty much everywhere online today, you're seeing a huge amount of content getting created around every single brand. Even Circle K last week had over 33,000 posts on social media with hashtags wow. Circle K. Nike's got in the millions, right? So every single week. And so you're losing control of your brand creative. So you need to start working with those creators, those people talking about your brand to bring that brand message back in. So what we like to say is find the creators that are either most outspoken, best represent your brand, whatever you want to do. And there's a lot of different ways that we tap into creators and, you know, we offer managed services to help brands do this. We actually do it for most of the over half of the brands that use Entribe. But basically we will find those creators and we will communicate with them at scale at first. 
first. And then we'll start finding the best creators and cr start creating a one-on-one -on -one relationship with them. And you need communication tools to be able to do that at scale. You need CRM tools to be able to organize those creators. And you need a content management system all married together so that you can communicate with them, track their content, know who the creators are, and pay attention to them over time. Because really all creators really want that are posting to social media with hashtag of brands is they want attention. They want that brand reaching back out to them because they're already talking about the brand. The brand talks back to them, then their ears pick up, then they can become brand ambassadors, then they can really hold your flag, but you have to tell them what you want them to say. And so the more that you do that, the more excited they get. And it's not about paying influencers. It's not about paying these creators. You know, they'd love to get rewarded. If you can reward them, great. You don't have to. Even social media credit. But what they want more than anything is attention. So if you can start creating a one-on-one -on -one relationship at scale through, a CR through some of these CRM tools that I'm talking about, then you can win in this game. So you hear 33,000 posts for Circle K or millions for Nike and envision the communication structures to manage each of those creators, show them the attention and have them continually posting, have that consistency there. So it's not just a one off. Yep. And even at GoPro, we didn't have tools for this. So I had 50 people on my team managing this, right? And I wanted to build a software product, something similar to Entribe to manage it for GoPro, but it didn't make sense for any one company to build it. Because if you build it for one company, you can duplicate it for every other company. So that's why I built right. Entribe. It's one SaaS platform that everyone can use, and it's scalable. If you build it for one company, it's probably, I mean, you might save a little bit of money, but it costs a lot to build these tools. Once you have these tools in place, it's the same for a university versus a Fortune 500 tech company where you're just trying to find creators talking about you, work with them at scale, and then it make, then it becomes easy because then one person on your marketing team with a couple hours a week can talk to your whole community and just can start segmenting those audiences into different pieces of what types of creators are you looking for? How do you want to communicate with this creator versus that creator? And all creators aren't created equally. So you want to be able to work with them on their individual basis, but at in a scalable way. So I'm picturing drip systems, just thinking of thousands of creators, CRM, hey, audience one, two, three, four, five, based on what, what vertical, what, what region, what you know, take your pick of specification that it, for, for that audience so you can have a basic system. And then, like you said, uh, have some uh, cu customization, some, some uniqueness to it. So if you're working with specific creators, if you're having your team uh, go in depth with some, they, they can then personalize it further. Uh, but you have your general system, you have that working at scale, and you could count on it for producing uh, likely a small percentage, but enough uh, new content from your audience each week? When you're at scale, 100% right. So once you're already at scale, yes, you need all, all those different tools. You need to approach it in different ways. But not all brands are created equal. Actually, most of the brands that get started with us haven't figured out their community yet, haven't figured out their content creator network yet. And so we have tools to get them started. We even work with some brands that haven't even launched yet to be like, all right, who should your creator community be? Let's go find those people and see if they want to participate. And so we can build from zero up to tens of thousands of creators. And we do. Um, but in general, most of our brands are just getting started with user-generated content because in the past, it was impossible to work with creators at scale. We say, if you've got 10 or 20 creators, you know, a marketer might be able to handle that. Once you get over 20 creators, it starts getting too robust. And once you get over 100 creators, forget about it. You're going to start losing things in the system. You're going to start losing um, track of your creators and they might get offended. And that's the worst thing you can do is offend one of your best creators. But what we like to say is get started with always on campaigns. So at GoPro, we had hashtag GoPro awards, always on campaign. You see, you do something great, send it to us and you could win an award for it. That was an always on campaign. And they're still rewarding over a million dollars a year for that. But we also like to say anytime that you have a new campaign, a new marketing stunt, a new marketing initiative, whether it's something for St. Patrick's Day or Christmas or, um, you know, Valentine's Day, whatever your next campaign is going to be. We actually ran a very cool one for Hershey's called the Hershey campaign for um, Women, National Women's Month um, or International nice. Women's Month. 
Um, yeah, and so it really, whatever campaigns you're already running, just build user-generated content into those campaigns. You don't have to create something from the ground up. It should be, user-generated content should be a part of your 360 marketing strategy in every step of what you're doing. So let's talk about that for a second, because I've seen brands that were more at that zero stage. Like you mentioned, uh, no creators yet. I want to get into that a little bit, see, see where brands fail. But before I get there, I, I want to talk about what a brand can do internally, meaning what are they doing to create these campaigns? What are they doing for their content calendar? Because if you just find an influencer or content creator and say, hey, talk about our brand, you have a community. There's not too much there for them to work off of where you're talking about very complex, sophisticated, standout campaigns. What basic fundamentals of, I'll call it content marketing, should a brand have in place before it starts reaching out to creators to then talk about that initiative? Because I noticed that even with my own content, if I put out an article and no one talks about it, I'm not going to get much traffic, engagement. If I have over 100 writers linking back to it, even if it's published on a top publisher like Forbes, it's going to be boosted in terms of traffic, positioning, everything about it. And I, I think that is true of, of most content marketing, where if you're putting out good content, you have good initiatives, good campaigns, as you're saying, going out, it, it's that much easier for a creator to latch on, put their own take, their own twist on it for their audience. Is there a baseline content marketing program that a brand should have in place before they start looking for, we'll say, tens of thousands of creators to join? You, you really don't need to. Your point is accurate that the more attention that you have on your campaigns, the more opportunity you have for participation. But you know what? We've actually done this outside of campaigns completely and just targeted individual creators on a one-on-one -on -one basis, especially for brands that haven't even got started yet in this area. Okay. And that's easy to do. And it's not that hard. But really, it's a three-step process. What we like to say is make it easy for them to participate give them a reason to participate, and then show them an example of what you're looking for. So make it easy for them to participate. It's a very simple call to action. Say, take a great picture of X or take a great video of Y, upload it here, and you can get rewarded. And that's the second step, which is give them an opportunity to get rewarded. And rewards can be as simple as, or sorry, give them a reason. A reward can be as simple as getting featured on a social media page of the brand. Mm. Or at the universities, it could be get your picture on the university website with like, we actually ran a campaign with a university, it was during COVID, kids are going back to the dorms, show us how you decorate your dorm rooms. And so we could show off their dorm rooms and they would get a little credit for it and that kind of thing and push their social media. Heather, one of our tech giants, gave away free camera phones to the best people that were taking pictures with their camera phones. That did two things. One, it was a great reward for the, their customers. And two, it gave them the newer phone so that they could take even better pictures in the future. So these kinds of, it's give them a reason. It can be lots of different kinds of reasons. And we work with brands to figure out what's the most authentic, best, easiest reason for that brand to be able to reward so they don't have to go out of pocket. They don't have to spend a lot of time and energy on something. It's something that's easy for them. Uh, we work with a sports team, give away hats to your sports team, that kind of thing. Um, something that's easy. Um, and then show them an example. So there's lots of ways of showing examples. The ones we like the best typically are just galleries on your website or, you know, at a theme park that we work with, they have big digital signage screens where they're showing off what other user generated content that they like is. And then there's a QR code saying, upload yours here. So you can see what other people are doing. And then you're like, oh, I can do that. And it makes it accessible. So that's one of the things that GoPro did really well is we had Sh Sean White, Kelly Slater, our inspirational athletes doing amazing aspirational content. But it was the authentic content. It was the associatable content that I th saw that I could say, oh, I could take that picture. I could take that video. And that made it much easier for people to upload stuff because they didn't have to be Sean White or Kelly Slater to be able to win an award or get even GoPro's attention. And <laughs> making it easy as possible, being able to yes. work with these, uh, you know, content creators. Uh, I, I love the reward system, you know, easy reason example, being able to use that as the reason. <sighs> As you go to creators with larger audiences, are you getting a lot of pushback for, you know, influencer rate cards? 
hey, we, we need to receive this much for this many posts to be on a story for two hours or 24 hours. Is there a lot of that going on? Or if the authenticity is there, you can actually find a lot of UGC, you know, user generated content creators, you know, open for that, that hat from the baseball team or to win a camera or whatever it may be. You know, it's an interesting question because yeah, the influencers are building their brands online and, you know, they're monetizing their followings and things like that. But what we like to say is if you're truly going after your authentic audience, the people that want to participate with your brand or already are because they're posting to your hashtag or they're trying to get your attention because they're already representing your brand in some way, they always participate because they're already doing it. You're just tell, teaching them how to do it better. And so they love that personal interaction. You will have a tiny bit of drop off from some of the higher end influencers that only charge their followings, but by nature, that's inauthentic. So then you're not losing anything because if they would only participate with you, if they're getting paid, they're inauthentic by nature. So we don't want those in, in the end tribe world. In the end tribe world, we're looking for an authentic audience that wants to participate already. So if you lose a few of those inauthentic creators, it's not a big issue for us. Make sure there's enough volume there. Go after the the actual fans, the actual community members. If they're asking for a rate and it's it's that or they're not going to be involved, they're they're not authentic to begin with. And the percentage like of the pay to play people are actually very small. You know, you're talking about less than one percent of people participating. It's a good way to look at it. We're often asked about you know specific influencers and and that's where I was asking about that zero. Um, you know, the, the group starting at zero, sometimes they'll reach out to a bunch of influencer networks and get, you know, $25,000 plus campaigns with very limited visibility into who's going to be posting about them as a proposal back and per potentially going after the wrong KPIs or not having their funnel refined enough to know that there's a consistent conversion rate and the KPIs they're looking for, the key performance indicators around uh, sales or, you know, something transactional or, or even uh, realistic to, to think about. Um, what are the biggest uh, failures? What, what, what are the biggest uh, obstacles, challenges that you see brands uh, uh, subscribe to for UGC? You know, any misconceptions at all? Uh, this could be at the zero. It could be at the 10,000 creator level. But, but what do you see in the mix where it's an immediate red flag? Ooh, that's, that's really not set up for success. We need to change some things around. A uh, couple things. So one is you're absolutely right that, um, you know, I knock influencers a lot. There is some value there because they do offer reach and frequency. And, you know, in some cases that reach and frequency is inauthentic. People buy followers and have bots and things like that. But in most cases, you can get reach and frequency. We're seeing a lot of obstacles where, you know, the red flags with brands typically are a fewfold. One, if they think that buying an influencer is true UGC. It's not really UGC. Buying an influencer is sort of like hiring a celebrity to do your TV commercial for you. It's really not any different than that. So if you consider George Clooney doing a Michelob Ultra ad or, you know, a uh, uh, Casamigos ad, UGC, <laughs> fine, but I don't. Um, but if you are trying to work with true UGC, the biggest issue there is quality of the content. They're hopping online, they're finding content on social media, and they just can't find the quality. And often when you hire influencers, the quality doesn't come back. Brands are often tainted by hiring an influencer network, paying 10 influencers to create content, and nothing really was what they were hoping it would be because they're not creating the quality that you're looking for. They're creating what they want to create, and they're slapping your brand on it. So the next step is um, rights management. So once you start working with a creator and you start getting that quality of the content up, because you have to work with them. Like I said, the first time you get a piece of content from somebody or the first time they post to social media, it's probably not going to be on your brand guidelines. But once you start working with them, you can get that quality up. We do it all the time and we build ambassador programs at N-Tribe where people are creating on-brand content week in, week out, which is fantastic. But then you need to make sure that you're clearing the rights in the right way. And most brands fail at that. So they'll hop on social media, they'll text the person, hey, do you mind if I use this in my marketing materials? The, the person will say yes, they'll take a screenshot of it. That's not true rights clearances. First, there's, I've been working rights clearances for over 20 years. That is not a legally binding document. Those creators are not do not understand what they're actually agreeing to. We 
you've got systems in place and then try to manage all that. Plus, you don't actually know if that creator actually took that photo or video. It's very possible they scraped it off of offline and put it and posted it or tried to sell it to you. And if you're paying somebody for content that's not even theirs, you're in double jeopardy. So what we like to say is make sure you have secure rights clearances, make sure you've verified authenticity and ver verified the ownership of that. Make sure you've educated them on what you're planning on doing with that content and make sure that you're working with the creator so that it gets better and better over time. And once you build that trust between you and the creator and you can trust them that it's their content and they know what they're doing, you can work with them almost like they're part of your marketing team. What about advertising? And I know we've talked about authenticity. Uh, I, I ask because we've used advertising with, with user generated content with with influencer uh, content in the past and looked at it as uh, uh, syndication. So a post is live for a small period of time with a you know heavy spotlight on it kind of fades away after that. But if we're continue to use it uh, with our paid traffic uh, approaches, have you seen that work? Have you looked at special ways to reserve rights to be able to uh, utilize in advertising and other types of uh, campaigns? Absolutely. So first of all, I'll answer the second part of that first. Um, with our basic terms and conditions, the basic right clearances at Entribe, you can use in any form of advertising in perpetuity. So we clear content for advertising all the time, and our brands use it in almost all of their ads, and we see it resonate almost 11 times better than other ads. So it um, people smell the authenticity, they realize this is a real person actually selling me something that they really like. That resonates so much better than an actor just trying to push a product that they may not may or may not use in their real life. So people... I, so I say, use it in ads. We actually used um, user-generated content in a Super Bowl commercial for GoPro. If you look at GoPro, pretty much everything is user-generated content, almost everything. Yes, they use influencers, but those influencers are authentic to the brand because they're doing those action sports on a daily basis, and they're recording themselves because that's how beca they became famous. So in certain cases, you can use influencers where the authenticity still screams true. But the stuff that really resonates, the stuff that really sold those cameras is the stuff that you can associate with, the stuff that you feel like, like oh, that person's just like me. And so we say, yes, use it in ads. The more localized, the more specific, the more targeted you can do, it, the better. And so, um, you know, we say if you're a car dealership in Louisiana, don't put an ad up from a guy in California on the Bay Bridge. Do an ad from a guy in Louisiana talking about the truck that you just bought. That it'll resonate better and people can associate with it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, just trying to think of what questions I would get from founders around this topic. And I've heard some fears before around UGC. You know, what if it opens up the floodgates with uh, unhappy customers and you work with a large enough volume of clients, customers, it's, it's bound to happen, even if it's a decimal of a percentage of the time. Does, does this require more needs for reputation management and response matrix uh, type discussions for those types of audiences in your experience? A hundred percent. And especially in today's world where privacy is becoming such a huge concern, social media is gone so crazy that we call it the social media wild. You can't control what's happening on social media. Run a hashtag campaign. That's great for brand awareness. It might not be great for your brand image because you have no control over what's happening on social media. So you might get a lot of attention. It might it be a lot of the attention that you don't want. So what we say is if you're going to run user generated content campaigns and you want to run it in the right way, you have to be able to curate that content. You have to be able to curate those creators as well as the content, because I'll just give you one example there. We were working on a campaign with a brand and one of the, it was a very politically correct brand. And one of the creators that they were about to start working with was a QAnon follower. And that did not resonate well with the brand. But we didn't realize that until we searched that person's social media feed going back about 50 pictures. We found it, we flagged it, and we ended up heading it off before we started working with that creator. So you want to know who you're working with, not just the content they're creating. You want to be able to curate that before you go into distribution. And so that's one of the things we do is we help you curate that content, curate those creators ahead of time in the back end before you publish it because once you publish it it's out there and we've seen on social media very recently a few brands 
really shoot themselves in the foot when they started working with either a creator they shouldn't have or they regret it later. And there's been a lot of social media pushback and it almost tanked some of the larger brands that you've seen in recent past. So what we say is if you're going to work with user generated content, it is a little bit trickier, but it doesn't have to be overwhelming and it doesn't have to be cost prohibitive or resource intensive. You, there are tools out there to help streamline the process and to make it easy for any brand to do it the right way. Absolutely. And we, we've worked with uh, video advertisements, uh, with, with influencers, with celebrities involved that over a long campaign had different results, let's say mid-campaign, let's say six months into a 12-month push where that celebrity was featured in the media uh, as an environmentalist, but was getting political backlash from an opposing viewpoint. So we had to take extra steps into reputation management on the con comments on the advertising. Uh, at, at a certain point, had to pull back the creative a bit, but then after a month or so, we we're able to... Uh, see from the data it was working again but but it, it, it's not always as uh, simple as it sounds is what i'd like to add there what appears to be a good fit in the beginning uh you know over time over external cultural factors uh, could change so just keeping an eye on it like like you said should be part of best practices well and one of the advantages of user generated content truly working with a creator community is you're spreading your um, bets over a lot of people, right? So you're not mm -hmm. working with one or two. And so even if the reputation of one goes south, hopefully you're working with a hundred or a thousand creators and you're pushing out a huge volume of content and you're not focusing on one specific creator. If you focus on one creator, there's a lot of risk there. You don't know what they're going to yeah. do. You don't know what's going to happen to them. They could get hit by a bus tomorrow. But if you work with a huge wide variety of creators, you're diluting that risk, right? You're spreading that risk around a little bit, which is nice. But you, it, it, you're, the investment that you're putting in one creator can be spread across lots of creators in lots of content, and you can create that network effect. So it can build over time. So to your point about over a year, you know, in the middle of the year, maybe they got more attention. Maybe it wasn't the right attention. For us, it seems to snowball because as you build 10, 20, 30 creators, other people start seeing their content, they want to participate, and they you get the network effect of their followers, their audiences. And so it starts building over time. So what we like to say is get started early. The beginning isn't going to be a slam dunk. The beginning is going to be let's start educating creators and get them on board and start working with their content. And over the next year, two years, it's only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And have more eyes on and more peer-to-peer -peer marketing around it. I'm going thinking back to your GoPro discussions. Uh, and as an athlete myself, what an honor it would be to be featured by GoPro, maybe even in, in one of the advertisements. I would certainly talk about that and continue to share it so I could see how it continues to evolve, you know, years out. I remember, um, so the Virgin America Seatback channel was one of our most watched channels because, you know, you're on an airplane, you might may or may not have enough time to finish a show or a movie, flip it on, and it's just great entertainment. And we would actually see more more people on Virgin America's watching the GoPro channel than anything else. And what they were really watching was all that user-generated content because we would just yeah. flood those channels with user-generated content, and it was addicting. And you don't have to be GoPro to have that kind of addicting, but having that volume of content can really change a brand. And I've seen people point it out in other contexts as well, too. I think uh, dating apps, travel channels. Oh, I was featured here. I was featured there. And I am definitely guilty of watching the, uh, maybe not that airline, but a different airline, not to say they're competing, but, but another airline looking at all the different local posts for the destination I was going to. It's very cool. And it can be used in a lot of good ways. Uh, speaking of you know how UGC can be used in a good way, how can brands use UGC to uh, market uh, inclusivity and be able to, to seek that out and even look for solutions around UGC and show their actual audiences? 
I love that because that's one of the biggest advantages of user generating content. You can show all walks of life, all kinds of people, because you can attract such a volume of content and you're getting your authentic audience, right? And you're not, you don't have to segment people out by where they live and what they look like. It's actually better if you're just leaving it open saying, this is my campaign, send us what you're doing about that. Even the Hershey campaign that I mentioned, we were getting content from men talking about amazing women. And we were getting, we did a video game. Um, it was the, we helped riot games with the league of legends world championship live stream. And so we were getting nice. live content from all over the world of viewers that wanted to participate with this live, um, live event. And so you can do it from live events. You can do it from people sitting on their couch at home or in movie theaters, watching that, um, live event where they were sending in how they were supporting their teams. And so Featuring that participation, featuring we even worked with the automobile um, sponsor of the World Cup, and we did the same kind of thing where people from all over the world could show their support for their teams, and you were showing all walks of life, and it was the perfect um, inclusivity and diversity exercise for content and for content creation that became their commercials. What a great way to call on that community. Imagine it had a variety of different benefits uh, you know, outside of that. But where do you picture this all going? And as there's emerging technology with, you know, wearables and virtual worlds and our lives are becoming more and more digital, where do you envision user-generated content 10 years or further out? You know, it's a great question. And so what we can talk about is trends that we're already seeing. We're already seeing that camera phones are creating quality of movie theaters, right? So you can, so the quality of content creation is getting better. The ease of creating compelling content we're seeing from TikTok and other platforms is becoming so much easier. Even YouTube's releasing their new AI engine to help short form content creators create anything they want, even without a lot of talent. So content creation is getting better. More people are creating content and the, the quality threshold of what's acceptable content is actually coming down. So what you're seeing, like if you look at Gen Z, what are they watching online? They're not watching the highly polished big TV shows. They're watching YouTube videos and clips of people doing things in their backyard or playing with toys. It You don't need to have high quality content to make it compelling and to resonate with audiences. And so we're seeing content creation explode, especially through AI. Um, and higher quality cameras and you know better editing tools, et cetera. We're seeing the quality of acceptable content come down and more and more people wanna be content creators because there's more ways of making money, communicating. And this is how people communicate today. You know, like hundred years ago, we got a telephone, great. You know, 20 years ago, we got social media. People started talking about everything online. Now people communicate through photos and more, more videos. So if you don't get on board with this earlier, it, you're going to be washed out because there's going to be such a flood of content about every single brand, about every single topic that you need to get your arms around all of it, not just one little segment to be able to do something. And more and more, we're going to see content getting fragmented, audiences getting fragmented because there's such a volume of content. I mean, you can imagine just Netflix, Amazon, everybody else producing TV shows. Audiences are getting segments and people are going to gravitate towards what resonates with them best. So you got to hop on board with those verticals in those specifics to get your audiences. And so, you know, we're going to be flooded with more content. That's not slowing down. The quality is going to get better and the threshold is going to get lower. So you've got to find your audiences and you got to hold on to them. Sure. And the quality is really about that authenticity to begin with, right? I mean, like you said, the threshold's going down. We run a lot of investor marketing campaigns for startups who think they need that broadcast quality studio video presentation. And we'll test that out for some clients, some, some groups issuing shares and even selling securities uh, with their campaigns. They often see the best results from a selfie video. And, you know, yep. with the camera quality improving, but all about that authenticity, it's not working because it's done with that video device. It's it's because of the connection with the audience and the problem, the solution, the personal story and how I'm telling it to you in 15 to 30 seconds versus too much stock imagery and videography and floating text. It feels more like a video that's posted to the social media platform. The audience is scrolling through once they actually engage with it to begin with. So 
I, I just wanted to repeat the word authenticity in all fairness. I, I love your use of it uh, and how you guys are leveraging it with UGC. Yeah, you know, it's really at the core of everything we do. And we probably say authenticity even more than you do. <laughs> because <laughs> that's, that, I mean, that's what matters in today's marketing. That's what matters with today's audiences. And that's what matters matters in today's creative. And so if you don't have that authenticity, you're going to lose your audience and you're going to lose your customers. And if you do have that authenticity, you have all the opportunity in the world. And speaking of that opportunity, want to package some actionable insights for listeners, founders who are tuning in perhaps, what, what could they be testing out? towards their own UGC strategy, towards their own content and, and making it more authentic. What are some tips that they could use for their own model? So whether you have a UGC campaign now or not, take a little bit of your marketing dollars and experiment with it because I promise you it's going to start working. And it takes a little bit of time and it won't happen in the first month, but it'll definitely happen in the first few months and it starts building over time. But you want to get started now. Because the earlier you get started, the easier it's going to be. It's a compounding effect. So get started with the user-generated comp campaign now. Build it into each of your already existing marketing initiatives. It doesn't take a lot of money. doesn't take a lot of time. But it definitely can piggyback on everything else you're doing, and it can amplify it. So get started now. Get started early. And you can get started small. It doesn't take a lot to get moving. But once you get moving, it's easier to grow. And so what we like to say is, whether you use a platform like Entribe or not, start working with user-generated content, start managing. If you're using influencers, fine. If you're using micro-influencers, better. If you're really reaching out to all of your authentic community, that's the best. And start bringing them into your marketing fold. And then you can see all the upside that user-generated content can do. But also back to the authenticity, you're going to see that authenticity resonate with your audiences. And it's just going to build your trust. And what if it's not working right out of the gate? And often doesn't, right? It can yep. at least improve over time. What are the what are the best approaches towards optimization? Yep. So all brands aren't created equal, right? But half, what works for my um, top five tech company isn't the same for my edible printing company out of Los Angeles with a couple employees. Um, we sure. do a lot of A-B testing. And so we test how different activations work, where to activate, how to activate your customers. So, you know, we do a lot of activations through social media. We've found a couple of brands that their customers don't really pay attention on social media. They might be posting on social media, but they don't really pay attention to social media. So we activate at events, we activate on location, we activate where those customers are participating. And so you really wanna test out where you're activating your customers, whether it's their email blast, text message campaigns, social media campaigns, on site at events or in your retail stores. And then you also want to test out the different kinds of messaging, what you're asking for them, because maybe you're asking for too much. Maybe you're not making it easy. Going back to those three steps, maybe you're not making it easy to participate. Maybe you're not giving them a reason to participate, or maybe you're not um, uh, rewarding them for participating. And you got to play around with those three levers of how you're doing each one. Make it easier. Maybe it should be through an email blast or maybe it should be through a QR code. So reward them. Maybe play around with different rewards. Maybe social media credit's not enough. Maybe you need to give them some swag or maybe you need to like really help resonate and um, give them an example. Maybe you're not giving them the right examples. Maybe you're showing them something that's too glossy, that's too high touch that they can't associate with or they don't feel that they can do. So if you play around with those three levers, you'll be able to find the right fit. And we've actually never had a brand not have success after a few months. That's a, a great thing to add there. And once you see them having that success, what are the best approaches to, to scale? I think you're uniquely positioned to be able to answer this question, you know, hearing about some of the numbers at GoPro and, and with your clients. Now, uh, how do you take a campaign that is doing the right thing but to a larger stage and getting more creators, getting more performance, more traffic, more results associated to it. Well, that's a great point because we often have brands that hold like a three month campaign and then it drops off. They lose all those creators and it disappears. <laughs> you've got to keep piggybacking. So even if you don't have a campaign going for a month and you, you've got a gap, keep the creators, keep the CRM database. We actually had one of our customers that basically pulled back a lot of marketing budget because of the financial situation. Um, and so we said, you know what, 
a very reduced rate. We're going to keep your CRM up and running. We're going to keep communicating with your creators at a reduced rate. But when you're back and they just came back, we blew it out. And so we had that whole database of creators already there. We were working with them on a regular basis to amplify it. And now it's bigger than than ever. So even if you don't have all these on campaigns, piggyback off the same creators, off the same creative and start working with those creators and don't let them go. You can, once you've start, start building that user generated content creator network, it just amplifies over time. Yeah. You look at the stats and what happens to brands when they stop advertising abruptly and it's, it's not good. Uh, the organic traffic, it, it does not look the same. Uh, things that are coming from your marketing that you're not noticing, even just the influencer, the creator relationship itself. So find ways to continue building off of that. I could definitely echo and say, do not stop, continue optimizing, continue scaling. Don't have those pauses. There has to be transitions and pointing to the next initiative, but at least keep the communication going with those creators. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Adam, this conversation has been a lot of fun, getting a lot of great insights, even someone who's worked in user-generated content for some time, learning a great deal myself here. Are there any final thoughts you want to wrap the conversation up with and leave listeners with? And what's the best way for them to get in contact with you, get in contract with, uh, contact with N-Tribe? Yeah, so you can always email me, just adam at ntribe.com. That's E-N-T-R-I-B-E.com, Engage Your Tribe. Um, and so, or go to our website. There's lots of communication tools on the website to get in touch with my sales team, my customer success team, whoever you want to talk to. Um, you know, the best thing to do is get started and get started early. So the earlier you can get started, the more you can start building this network, the more you can start building trust. And it's really not that hard. So that's one of the biggest issues that we see with brands is they – they start stumbling because they don't know how to get started. Well, we can hold your hand. We can take you all the way through that step of, you know, the one, two, threes of getting user generated content campaigns going, how you can create a creator network. And it's not that it should be a replacer influencer campaigns. Those can be valuable in their own right. It actually can amplify them, but you should take some of your marketing dollars just as you did five years ago and start investing in influencers, get started with user generated content now, because I promise you, you'll be rewarded for it. I back that statement, Adam, can't agree with you more on these points and the way you guys are approaching UGC. I hear that word thrown out there a lot these days, but the fundamentals you've talked about, the best practices, the insights, uh, I believe uh, is what makes the difference between a successful influencer UGC program uh, and one that is tested and, and let go quickly. So definitely recommend listeners, viewers to get in touch with Adam and uh, per that very welcoming in invitation. Um, and Adam, I want to thank you again for taking the time to uh, hop on the pod here today. Thanks so much. I can't wait to see you up in Tahoe soon. All right. Sounds good. Sounds like a plan. And I want to thank everybody for tuning in. We'll see you next time. 